Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to our evening service here in the building. And at, at joining us on the live stream at any point during the week when you're catching up with our time together and the sermon and the notes that um, have been prepared for this week wonderfully by Carol, who is going to bring us uh, our sermon on Colossians this evening. And, um, and so we look forward to that. Uh, so, uh, welcome. Um, don't mind the fact that I'm over here if you're in the building. And if you're over here, well, you'll just follow me anyway because you're on the camera. So, uh, And so, um, anyway, it's great to welcome you all to, uh, well, to be together again this evening. Uh, and to welcome you back for if you were here this morning and if you joined us fresh this evening. Hope you had a good day. Nice to see you. Um, and this evening, as we're going through Colossians, Colossians, there's just so much within it which speaks of the work of the Spirit of God over and against the forces on our powers in the world in which um, we live today. And so as we worship the Lord, um, I, I sensed it was right to invite us to consider uh, and to worship him in response to the work of his spirit. Uh, and so there may be some times of open worship as such this evening um, that we don't necessarily or haven't necessarily utilised recently. Uh, just, just the way it is. Um, and so if we get to one of those times, Feel free to sit comfortably if you would like to. Feel free to respond in however you feel led. Um, there's no obligation for anyone to have to do anything. There's no pressure or anything like that. Uh, and so we'll just we'll worship the Lord together uh, and prepare our hearts to receive what uh, he would like to say to us through Carol a bit later as well. Uh, so let me pray for us as we begin. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are over all things, that there is nothing in heaven and on earth that takes a place higher than you, that you are supreme in the truest sense of that word. And so, Lord, we come to praise you this evening. We gather to worship you and we invite you now to come and move amongst us, minister to our hearts and cause us to uh, help us to see your face smiling down upon your people. Lord, may we know your joy and your presence with us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we're going to begin with uh, the song Spirit of the Living God uh, as an invitation, as a welcome to the Holy Spirit to come and to move amongst us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me.
flesh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. He's coming on the clouds Kings and kingdoms will bow down Every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion The Lion of Judah battles and every knee will bow before him our God is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the for him Open up the gate, make way before the King of Kings. A God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him stop the Lord Almighty? Who can 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 stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him And so in the next few minutes, 
I would just like to invite you to pray for yourself quietly in your hearts. Pray aloud if you feel so led. But take a moment to respond to the Lord. You may sit, you may stand, you, whatever you feel is uh, right and necessary. But a quiet moment of open prayers and then I'll start to lead us again in our next song uh, when we're ready. You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before my failure Carried the cross for my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stand So what could I say? And what could I do? heart, O oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, this life to declare your promise my soul now to stand what could i say what could i do but offer this heart oh god completely to you What could I say? What could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Although we don't uh, seem to have the words this evening, the next part of this song is quite, um, quite simple and repetitive. So uh, as you hear the words, um, let's try and memorize them together. Uh, and, uh, and we'll sing it through a couple of times that we might continue in our worship. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all. I am, is yours. I'll 
shall stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all i'll stand my soul lord to you surrendered all i am is yours and sing that one more time so i'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all i'll stand my soul lord to you surrendered all i am is yours all i am is yours all i am is yours Yes, Lord, we stand with, in our hearts with our arms high and our hearts open wide. Recognising that actually as we step into your presence, as we give ourselves to you, you receive us. And you make yourself known to us in a tangible way. So Lord, we glorify your name this evening. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you that we can stand and worship the supreme Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We glorify your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, our reading this evening, uh, if anyone would like to find it, you're welcome. If anyone would like to read it for us, you're welcome to do that too. That would be lovely. I shan't pick on anyone, mention any names. We're on a live stream after all. Yeah. Would anyone like to uh, read? Our reading's from Colossians, of course, and um, it's from chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Read yeah, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Any, that's great. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So I'd like to invite Carol uh, to come and to share God's word with us this evening. Um, we're just going to, for those of you at home, we're just going to pan you across. Okay, tonight we're looking at Colossians, and um, I want to start with the background to the letter, because it's absolutely essential to understanding why Paul is writing in the way that he is. 
Now, the town of Colossae was situated in the Roman province of Asia, about 100 miles east of Ephesus, and it was near the neighbouring towns of Laodicea and Hierapolis, which are actually mentioned in the letter. And everyone who's read the accounts of Paul's missionary journeys in Acts will realise that Colossae doesn't appear on them. And that's because this church was not planted by Paul. And actually, at the point of him writing this letter, it was a church he'd never actually visited. And in 2.1, Paul refers to the fact that these believers had not met him personally. So we have to ask, who established the church and why is Paul writing to it? Well, it seems the church was begun by Epaphras, who Paul mentions at both the beginning and the end of the letter. And in 1.7, Paul says they learned the gospel from Epaphras, who he calls a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And the general understanding is that Epaphras met Paul during Paul's um, three years in Ephesus, where he became a believer and was taught by Paul. And from there, Epaphras took the gospel back to Colossae, where he was from, and he established this church. And it would have been a church made up primarily of Gentile believers, although, although there were Jews in Colossae, so there would have been some converted Jews also. So it's not surprising you know, that Paul had a real concern for this church because he had a personal connection to it. And his, his concern comes across in the letter. And again, 2.1, he says, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you. And he means struggling in prayer. Paul carried a great burden for the churches. And he discharged that burden, not only by teaching, as he's doing um, in this letter, but by constant and earnest prayer that the believers would grow in the knowledge of Christ and grow to maturity. That was always Paul's great goal. And obviously it should always be our goal. But why is Paul now writing this letter? Well, we know from statements in the letter that Paul is writing this from prison. And the general belief is that this was when Paul was under house arrest at, in Rome. And when you look at the dates, it means that actually this was still a very young church, only about five years old. But it seems that Epaphras has gone to visit Paul to speak to him because the church was being threatened by some dangerous false teaching that if it was embraced, was going to undermine the believer's hold on Christ. And so Epaphras is seeking Paul's intervention as an apostle of Christ. And I think this stands as a real important reminder to us of the danger that we are in, uh, from being led away from Christ by false teaching. And you'll remember that when Paul left the believers in Ephesus, he warned them about the danger of false teachers coming in or even rising up among them who would lead believers away after them. And this is what we see here. Within just a few years of this church being established, false teaching was threatening its faith and its life. And it's something that we really must take seriously because one of the devil's main tactics against the church is to lead it away from a true faith in Christ by false teaching. And today, in some ways, we're more vulnerable than ever because we don't just have teaching in the church, we have Christian conferences, we have books, Christian radio, Christian television, the internet, and as we engage with these things, we need to be mindful. There will be, will be false teaching amongst the good. And we need to be constantly alert. But what, what was the particular nature um, of, the, uh, of the error that was endangering the church? And we do need to consider this because it helps us to understand how the points that Paul's making. And the error isn't completely clear but from what Paul says and how he addresses it, it seems it was a mixture of three main things. First of all, one of the things in the mix was a kind of Jewish legalism, where the believers were being told, as well as believing in Christ for salvation, they needed to keep certain food laws or observe special days or even be circumcised. And all of this was bringing them into bondage to external observances, and it was also leading them away from the truth that Christ has done all we need for salvation. 
But then combined with that, there was a kind of rigorous asceticism, which involved sort of denying the flesh and harsh treatment of the body. And in verse 21, Paul warns them against rules like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And these practices, they seemed very devout, but they were leading the believers away from the truth that the power to live a godly life comes through our union with Christ. And these sorts of practices were absolutely no value in dealing with the flesh. And then added to all that, there seems to have been elements of pagan mysticism. So it's like the worship of angels and receiving personal mystical visions and revelations. And by exalting angels and all these direct revelations from God, these false teachers were undermining the preeminence of Christ. So there was this, this odd mix of things. But the important thing to see that all of them had one crucial thing in common, and that they were, it's that they were not according to God's truth, but they had their origin in human and worldly wisdom and traditions. And it all seemed very impressive and good. But in 2.8, Paul calls these teachings hollow and deceptive because they were adding to Christ and the gospel, and if embraced, they would lead the people away from Christ into an empty religion that was absolutely of no spiritual benefit whatsoever. And I think it is a real reminder to us to keep ourselves anchored in God's truth, especially God's truth in Christ, and not to be taken in by human ideas and traditions that will just take us away from simple faith and life in Christ. And we do need to be alert because today we might not encounter exactly the same errors um, that were threatening the Colossian church, but we will encounter similar sorts of things. And I remember a while ago going to a meeting where someone was teaching some new insight that they'd gained from God about anointing with oil. And I know, I know anointing with oil is mentioned in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in Mark with the ministry of the disciples in James 5, where it speaks of the elders anointing the sick with oil. But this was something quite different. And everybody had little pots of oil and they're running around dobbing everybody else with oil. And it, it was a sort of an attractive teaching, but I'd never heard it before. And something about it didn't seem quite right. So when I got home, I got out my concordance and other study books to, te to check it out. And it was, wasn't biblical. It just wasn't there in the Bible. And I know it's not everyone's thing to do that kind of checking. But I, I think if any of us hears someone claiming they've had some special revelation or new insight, or we hear some new teaching we've never heard before, before we take it on board, we do need to check it out. You know, perhaps ask somebody who we trust, you know, is this right? Is this what the Bible teaches? Or is this something that just comes out of human wisdom or some supposed revelation of God? And we must do that so we're not taken away by things that might have the, 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 the appearance of sort of great wisdom or deep insights, but they're actually taking us away from the simple truth that there is in Christ. But how then does Paul tackle this threat? Well, I think what's notable is he doesn't engage in detailed discussion of the error, which is why we're left trying to kind of surmise what it is. Paul's big concern was that these errors were leading the believers away from simple faith and life in Christ. So what he does is he sets Christ before their sight. And he shows them that Christ is all they need. And particularly, he sets them before them the supremacy of Christ and the all-sufficiency of Christ and living in union with him. So we... I need to go back. Sorry, it's jumped to... Sorry about this. That's it. It's jumping all over the place. That's it. And the, the, the letter has an introduction, then there is a main body of the teaching, and then there are Paul's final greetings at the end. So I want to, to look at it in that order. 
Now, in the introduction, we see that after Paul gives his customary greeting in verses 1 and 2, he begins with thanksgiving and prayer. And what's notable here is that straight away, we see him pointing to Christ and beginning to counter the problem. And first of all, in his thanksgiving, he gives thanks for the saving and transforming work that the gospel has done in their lives, which is evidenced by their faith and their love, which springs from the hope they have. And he writes of how this gospel, which came to them through Epaphras, is bringing forth fruit everywhere it's preached. I think in saying this, at the outset, Paul is reminding them of how they first became believers and their lives were transformed. It was through hearing the gospel of God's grace in Christ. You know, we said these believers were being in, um, in danger of being persuaded that religious practices were necessary for salvation. But the reality was they had been saved purely by God's power working through the message of Christ. And I think when we read the letters of Paul, and he begins, you know, to the church in, to the church in Colossae or Ephesus or wherever it is, I think it's good to remember that even in that introduction, we're reading about a miracle where, you know, in a city devoid of the knowledge of Christ, through the gospel and through the power of God's spirit, God has transformed the lives of people and planted an outpost of heaven in this dark world. And it's a miracle of God's grace. Nothing to do with it. It's a miracle of God's grace. And I think, I think you, you read that in the very first line, to the church of Colossae, you're reading a miracle. God did it. But then Paul goes on to say in verse 9 that his continual prayer for them is that they may be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Not, not human ideas, but the understanding that God gives through his word. And he says he desires this so that they might live a life worthy of Christ and that they might be a joyful and a thankful people. And he reminds them in verses 12 to 13 what they've got to be thankful about. They have a wonderful inheritance because God has rescued them from the kingdom of darkness and brought them into the kingdom of his son in whom they have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And again, even here, Paul is trying to counter the problem because he knew that what we believe and our growth as believers is inseparable. And if the believers were led away by the teachings of men, that they would lose their hold on Christ and they would not grow in grace. So he makes clear his desire for them to have spiritual understanding, which is found in God's truth and in Christ. And it's by that that we'll grow spiritually and live lives that are pleasing to Christ. But... It's going to change this time. If we come to the main, that's it. If we come to the main body of the letter, and in this whole main body, the central section of his teaching, Paul sets before them four main things that will counter the false teaching that was threatening their hold on Christ. And the first thing he does is set before them the supremacy of Christ. And he wants to start by reminding them that Christ is superior to all things in every respect. And here, first of all, Paul makes clear that Christ is the image of the invisible God. And he's pressing on us the fact that in Christ, God's Son come, into it, come in the flesh, we see the per person and the purpose of God. And this means if we want to know God and his loving purpose towards us, what we might surmise about God with our human wisdom is completely irrelevant. What we need to do is look at our Lord Jesus Christ because in him we see our God and his saving love. I think when we read the Gospels and we see there that all that Jesus did, all that he said, and ultimately we behold him dying on a cross, I think it's good to keep at the very front of, my, uh, of our minds, this is my God that I am beholding in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then with that, pressing on them that Christ is the image of God, Paul, Paul makes clear that Christ is supreme 
over, both over this present creation and the new creation that God is establishing through Christ's saving work. And here Paul is really at pains to make clear, verse 17, that Christ existed before all things. Christ himself is not a created being. He is the eternal God. But rather he is the one by whom and through whom all things were created, both in heaven and upon earth. And Paul wants the Colossians to give Christ the supremacy as the author of and ruler over this creation. So he is the one to be honoured and worshipped, not angels or any lesser things. Christ is supreme. But then he goes on to make clear that through his death, death and resurrection, Christ is also now supreme over his body, the church, and he is the source of all its life. And we know that we live in a world alienated from God and spoilt by sin. And Christ is not only the creator of the world, but here Paul's saying God has chosen through him also to reconcile us and reconcile all things to himself, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And again, it's that Christ might have the supremacy so that it is him that we honour and worship. And the great confession of the church is Jesus is Lord. And this truth should shape everything. It should shape our worship, so that honouring and worshipping Christ is at the heart of our worship services. It should shape our living. As we live under his lordship, we seek to live lives in obedience to him and worthy of him. And it's also relevant to our evangelism because I think it challenges our motivation. We share the gospel because we want to see people saved and added to the church. But part of our motivation must be to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ as we set before people the, the glorious message of, of our God in the person of Christ coming to this earth to die on a cross for our salvation, but now exalted above all things. It's, it's a message of exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, of course, the gospel that, that Paul gladly suffered for. And he did it because of what it was accomplishing, and it, what it was accomplishing in the saving of souls, but also to the glory of Christ. I preach Christ and him crucified. That was Paul's mantra. Having set before the believers the supremacy of Christ, Paul moves on to impress upon them the all-sufficiency of Christ. This is chapter 2. And the key verses here are 2, verse 9, uh, 9 to 10, the beginning of 10. In Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. And some versions have, you are complete in him. And in this section, what Paul wants us to understand is that in Christ and through our union with him, we have everything we need for salvation and life. We lack nothing and there's nothing to add. And this glorious truth is the main thing that the Colossian believers were being moved away from by the false teaching that had come into the church. And so in this section, we find Paul much more directly addressing the error and pressing on the believers, Christ is all we need. And in essence, what he's saying in this chapter is, we don't need human insights or new revelations. In Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We don't need outward circumcision. Rather, in Christ and through our union with him in his death and resurrection, we have the circumcision of our hearts, the putting off of the sinful nature. We don't need rules and regulations to be put right with God because Christ has cancelled all these written regulations that stood against us and he's brought us forgiveness through his death on the cross. And we don't need to engage in harsh treatment of the body to deal with the flesh. What we need to grow and be fruitful is to keep rooted in Christ and built up in him. And when Jesus was born, it was said, he shall be called Jesus, which means God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. 
Jesus is a saviour of sinners. We come to him as sinners, and in him we find everything that a sinner needs. Forgiveness, redemption, justification, sanctification, all life and fruitfulness. In other words, we have been given fullness in Christ, and we lack nothing, and then to him goes all the glory. And I think here Paul is hammering this home because there is a tendency for us all the time to lose touch with the all-sufficiency of Christ and to get caught up in external rituals and human traditions or keeping rules and regulations. And for Paul, being taken away by these things was a real failure to grasp that all that Christ has accomplished through his death and resurrection and all we have in him. And he also knew it could bring us into bondage to these things. And um, in a previous church I belonged to, one week the minister was taken ill. And at very short notice, I was asked to take the Monday, Sunday morning service. And I chose some songs, prepared the sermon. And um, at the end of it all, I thought it had gone quite well. But... <laughs> It caused a major, and I mean major, upset in the church, and this is, not, this is amongst adults, not children, because it was the first Sunday of Advent and I'd forgotten to do Advent candles. Now, I'm not saying anything about the rights and wrongs of Advent candles, but if some sort of religious practice or tradition means so much to, to you or to me that you couldn't overlook someone forgetting it, then you or I have a problem because we're caught up in externals and not in Christ. And really, the, the words of the old hymn sum, sum it up. I nothing lack if I am his and he is mine forever. The all-sufficiency of Christ. But then, having set before them both the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Christ, Paul then goes on to describe how we live in the light of this. And he turns from doctrine to practice in that order. Because if we try to live this life apart from a proper understanding of the truth in Christ, our living will be defective and shallow. And Paul begins by pressing on the Colossians, and this is now chapter 3, the key to godly living. And again, it's got nothing to do with keeping outward observances or practicing asceticism. It starts with what our minds are set on, verses 3, uh, 3, 1 to 4, because that affects how we live. And what Paul is saying here is knowing that we're united with Christ and we share in his resurrection life, we are now to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, our minds are not to be taken up with external religion, with rituals, man-made traditions, but with heavenly realities. That is where true godly living will, will begin. And an accusation that's sometimes levelled at people is, you know, they're so heavenly-minded, they're of no earthly use. This is saying, be heavenly-minded. Think on our risen and exalted Saviour, and the life you have in him, and then you will know life and be fruitful and you'll be of use on this earth. But having kind of got our minds in the right places, Paul then goes on to say, with this mindset, through the power that we have in Christ, we're to deal with sin. We're to put away the sins of the flesh, of the old life, and he mentions here things like sexual impurity, lust, anger, malice, wrong use of the tongue. We're to put those things off, and then we're to clothe ourselves with or put on Christ-like qualities, qualities like compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, and supremely love, which binds us all together. And someone once put it like this, we're to put off our grave clothes and we're to put on our grace clothes. We're to put off the sins that take a person to death and we're to put on all the qualities we have in Christ by grace. And, and that's the key to godly living. And it's helpful to see that it involves an exchange of one way of living for another. So say, for example, we exchange malice for praying blessing on people. We exchange impatience for forbearance and kindness. And it's this that is the key 
to personal growth and to being a church, a people that are living in unity, in love. And ultimately, obviously, it'll bring glory to Christ who's given us this new life. But then having described the key to godly living, Paul just ends with uh, describing godly living in two specific situations. First, within the Christian household, and then in relation to those outside the church. And, I mean, the household is and was in those days the basic unit of society. But in the Roman world at that time, you know, the male patriarch exerted his iron fist authority over all in his household, you know, over his wife, his children, his uh, slaves. And Paul is making clear that a household that is first of all under Christ will not be like this. But rather, Christ's lordship will transform the relationships between husband and wife, parents and children, slaves and their master. And here he's not overturning natural differences, but he's describing a situation where there are responsibilities on each side and mutual relationships of, of um, respect and consideration and love. But then he also touches on our relationship to unbelievers. And he says that we are to be wise in the way that we behave towards those outside the church. And we're to be wise in the way that we speak. And we're to pray. And Paul was always concerned um, that the behavior of believers before the world did nothing to dishonor Christ or to discredit the gospel. And we need to have that concern as we interact with people in everyday life and as we seek to tell others, we need to be taking care that we're not a stumbling block. If, if they're going to stumble over anything, let it be the gospel. But let it not be over our behaviour. And, you know, we can live like this because in Christ and sharing in his resurrection life, we, ha we have the power to live a godly life in every situation, you know, in the church life, in the home, at work, in the world. And this is how we will show ourselves to be true disciples of our Lord Jesus, not by outward religion, but by living this out this new life that we have in Christ and becoming more like him. So... I hope this works. We've looked at the, um, the body of the text and Paul's emphasised these, these glorious truths, the supremacy of Christ, the all-sufficiency of Christ and godly living. But it leaves us with Paul's final greetings. There are one or two things to say here. I think one of the things that is notable here is that he particularly commends Epaphras to them and he stresses Epaphras' concern for them. I think in this he's pointing them again to their roots the gospel came to them through him. But also here we learn who's carrying this letter to Colossae. And it's being carried by Tychicus, who will be accompanied by Onesimus. And I mention this because we'll encounter Onesimus again when we consider Paul's letter to Philemon. But I also mention it because I want us to imagine this letter finally reaching the believers in Colossae, who at this point were in great danger of being led away from Christ by false teaching. And the custom was that when a carrier of the letter got there, it would have been read to them, probably by an elder of the church. And as they listened, what they would have heard was all about Christ, their, their, their exalted Lord and their all-sufficient Saviour. And this is what they needed to keep them safe. And we're not told what happened um, hopefully, this renewed revelation of Christ enabled them to resist the false teaching and to know Christ was their salvation. But I wanted to stress this because it's this that will keep us, us safe. We need to keep alert to false teaching. But what will equip us to recognize it and resist it and then to go on and live a life worthy of Christ is keeping Christ set before us, to keeping before us our glorious Lord, and our all-sufficient saviour. So it's, it's all about Christ. And in the notes, I've, I've put at the bottom of the notes, I, if, I, I sent them around on Friday, I don't know that everybody got them, but if anybody didn't get them, please say and try and get them to them. I've put some things for um, reflection on the notes, but I just wanted to say that the pivotal verses in Colossians are these Colossians 2, verse 9 to 10a. These are the pivotal verses. 
And I suggest that if, if people want something to meditate on this week, these verses would be a good thing. And they read, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. In other words, there is the completeness of God in Christ. And it goes on, And you have been given fullness in him. In other words, we are complete in him and we have all we need. Amen. Thank you, Carol. And um, as we uh, take a moment to allow the truth that God has spoken to us this evening to settle in our hearts, we're going to uh, we're going to worship before we we pray uh, for ourselves and for our world uh, and towards the end of our service. Uh, so, if you'd like to, please do stand as we sing uh, the goodness of God and remind ourselves that actually that in the fullness of Christ we experience all the goodness that God has to offer uh, to each of us. fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful have been so, so good, with every breath that I am able, oh I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice, you have led me through the fire, darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Cause your goodness is running after It's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now I give you everything Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now I give you everything Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me And all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful So good with every breath that I am in. Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm gonna 
mercy of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Please do be seated as we pray together this evening. Lord Jesus, you are our hope in life and death. And as Carol has reminded us, we fix our eyes toward you, Supreme Lord, in whom all authority is found, in whom the fullness of God dwelt and dwells, and in whom we find fullness of life. And so, Lord, you are our hope in life and in death. And we pray again, Lord, for Joan Hillier's family uh, as they begin to uh, walk through a journey of grieving uh, the loss of um, their mother. And, Lord, we do pray for them and for all those who have known Joan closely over the years. Lord, may your hope be present And may the knowledge of your joy bring comfort. Joy that Joan is no longer in a a place where she might struggle or suffer. And is instead with you in the fullness of life. And Lord, in that fullness we delight this evening. Lord, would you forgive us for the times where we've, we've paused from delighting in the knowledge that you have given all things to us. That in Christ is the fullness. In Christ is every spiritual blessing. In Christ is all that we need. Lord Jesus, we delight in that again this evening. We delight and bless your holy name. And Lord, we thank you that you are the sufficient and sustaining God of grace. And for our salvation, we marvel, Lord, that you have given it to us so freely. Lord, that you simply ask us to receive by faith. And as the Colossian church received from Paul, it wasn't by mystic thinking, it wasn't by uh, being overly ascetic, it wasn't by um, listening to the wrong voices or, or, or other forms of theological expression. It was in the faith that you have freely given to us. So Lord, remind us afresh, we ask, of that faith, uh, of that uh, life that you have created for us. We thank you for your uh, salvation, so freely given. And yet we thank you too, Lord, that it was so painfully won. Lord, it is not cheap, and we do not wish to ever cheapen it. We thank you that your grace is abundant and lavish. And you ask us in return to place our trust and hope and faith in you. And that we do. And we thank you, Lord, that this gift of salvation is powerful in Christ. It was powerful enough to raise Christ Jesus from the dead. And as Paul says, it is powerful. It is the same power that is at work in each of us. Lord, help us to walk in a greater knowledge of that truth. And as we think about living godly lives, Lord, we pause to pray for our world. Lord, our hearts break to know that so many people think such a low standard, a low bar, is an acceptable way to live. When we know, Lord, that you have such great things for, for, for all, that you, all those you have created for humanity. Lord, if people could lay aside the sins that so easily ensnare them and focus on you. Our world could be such a different place. And so, Lord, we do pray for our world. We pray for those who do not know you. We pray for those who have been blinded to you in some way, shape or form. Lord, would you lift blindfolds? Would you reveal, uh, reveal your truth and your presence with them? Help us, Lord, to be your hands and feet. Help us, Lord, to demonstrate all that we can in every way that possible. But we do pray for our world, Lord. And we acknowledge that in the ways that we can't, you can work. Lord, would you work powerfully and save people from uh, 
the strangeness today of varying forms of mystic ideas and what have you. And all the variety of the plethora of beliefs of what might be deemed okay. Lord Jesus, we declare that you are Lord and Saviour. And we ask, Lord, that you would reveal your heart, yourself to others. And uh, Lord, we ask for ourselves that you continue to reveal who, more of who you are to us. Holy Spirit, help us. Just as the church in Colossians was perhaps uh, tempted to follow different ideas or the different things, Lord, we pray for ourselves. And we acknowledge that we are not above the possibilities of temptation. So Holy Spirit, please help us in our weeks, help us in our months, and enable us to live godly lives for you. And Lord, help us to be bold as well. When we're surrounded by sin, Lord, that we don't judge, but we are prepared to say with boldness, actually, that's just not okay. That is a sin. Our world may not want to hear it, Lord. We recognise that, but help us in our boldness to stand and to say that is a sin. And actually, the life that is available in Christ is this instead. Why not? Why not this? So, Lord, help us in our boldness, we ask. And enable us to be all that we can be for you. Lord, we ask these things in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. And so as we close our time together this evening, um, we're going to sing one last song. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. If there was a, a, a modern worship song that captures the heart of Colossians, it is yet not I but it is Christ at work in me. So please do stand uh, if you're able and let's worship the Lord together. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more of heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is holy to his oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark but I am forsaken for by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deep this valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ. I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. When he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. 
is now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He would bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. So in the knowledge of the truth that we go in Christ, let us go into the week that lies before us in confidence and faith. Amen.